Welcome to Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers, reaching out with God's love, bringing people to Christ, touching lives around the world, and helping you find the answers you need today. Join us as we prepare to open God's Word and discover how your life can be changed forever by His great love worth finding. Would you find God's Word? Turn to Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38. Chapter 5 and verse 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, that is, go with him two miles. Give to him that asketh thee. And from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if, we, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect. And the word there perfect means mature. Be ye therefore mature, perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, the key to living with a smile is a Christ-centered life. The key to living a Christ-centered life is, first of all, emptying yourself out of your own self-life. Even God cannot fill that which is already full, so the uh, Christ-filled life is a self-emptied life. So many of us are so full of self, and as a wise man said, a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. I want you to think with me now on this principle, a principle of living, selfless living, joyful living, Christ-filled living, the principle of the second mile. And remember this, it's the second mile that brings the smile. Now, three things I want to tell you about the second mile this morning. And I pray God the Holy Spirit well, not only write them in your notes, but write them on your heart. Number one, the second mile is the mastery mile. Have you got that? It is the, the mastery mile. Now, what do we mean? In verse 41, when Jesus said, if anyone will compel you to go with him a mile, go with him two miles. What is he talking about? Well, in Jesus' day, the Romans had a practice. They learned this practice from the Persians about six centuries before that. When they would uh, conquer a land, they would also subjugate that land and uh, rule over it. And one of the things that they did to keep people in their place and to help them to understand uh, just who they were and who was in charge was the principle of the Roman mile. And in this day, a Roman soldier who had a backpack, a burden, or whatever, if he's walking along and he's tired and weary and he sees a young, able-bodied Jewish man there or a boy, he could say to him, you carry this pack. And by law, that Jewish boy had to pick up that Roman soldier's pack, his burden, and carry it for him one mile. They knew this. Some have said that every Jewish boy had a mile staked off from his property, from his farm, from his field, from his house, one mile. Because if he were compelled to carry a burden a mile, he would do it, but he would not go one inch, one step further with spite and hate and resentment. He would carry, he would carry that load and then dump it down 
He had done what the law had commanded. He had done what was required. It brought incredible resentment from the Jews. Not only had they, were they living as conquered people, not only were the Romans were in, in charge, but now they're humiliated. They're humiliated. Can you imagine when Jesus is preaching? <laughs> Can you imagine? He says, now if somebody compels you to go with him a mile, go with him two miles. Man, you never went to sleep when Jesus was preaching. <laughs> and I said, you, I can hear them. He must be jesting. Is he serious? I mean, does he expect us to carry for those Gentile dogs to do double duty? To go the second mile? That's exactly what Jesus was saying. What he's saying is we need to do more than the legalists, those who do what is required and not one bit more. Go back to verse 20. Jesus said, For I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees did exactly what they were required to do, not one jot, not one tittle more. Jesus said even when they tithe, they pay tithe, the mint, anise, and cumin. That is, they're counting the little mint leaves, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These are mine, ten. That's yours, Lord. I've done my duty. That is it. What is the principle of the second mile? What is the smile mile? What will put a smile on your face? It is to do more than is required. Now, what Jesus is saying is that any pagan can go one mile. He has to anyway. Look, if you will, in verses 46 and 47 of this same chapter. For if you love them which love you, <laughs> what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? You see, that's the first mile, just to love those that love us. And if you salute your brethren only, that is, if you're friendly to people that you know and love, <laughs> What do ye more than others? You've only gone a mile. Do not even the publicans the same. Now, what Jesus is saying is that we who are children of God are different. We're not legalists. We're not uh, lost. But we are filled with another principle, which is the principle of the smile mile, the second mile. You see, life is lived really on three levels. First of all, there is the hellish level. The hellish level, and a lot of people in the world live on the hellish level, that is to return evil for good. And there are people like that who return evil for good. That's the hellish level. Now, the human level, the very best you could hope for without the new birth is to return good for good and evil for evil. That's the human level. But the heavenly level is to return good for evil. Now, when you return uh, good for good, evil for evil, that's the first mile. But when you return good for evil, that is the second mile. Now, a boy, a Jewish boy, who is carrying that Roman pack the first mile, he is a slave while he's doing that because he's required to do it. But when he carries that pack the second mile, he is no longer a slave. He's the one in control. Think about it. He's the one who says, I am now in charge. I'm not doing what you tell me I must do. I am now doing what I want to do. I am no longer the slave. I am in mastery right now. I am now under control. Now, the devil wants to keep you, I mean, under self-control. The devil wants to keep you under his control. But when you finally say, I am not the devil's slave, I am in charge of my own life now, I'm not doing what is required. I'm doing more than is required. Then move your ears back and get ready for a smile. Now, folks, let me tell you something. The, the, the second mile is the mastery mile. Now, here's the second thing I want you to learn. Not only is the second mile the mastery mile, but the second mile is the charity mile. You see, you do the first mile out of legalism. You do the second mile out of love. And it is love that brings joy. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they were very careful to do the first mile. I'm talking about in biblical legalism, not only carrying a Roman's backpack, 
but in biblical legalism. They did that because they were self-righteous prigs. In those Pharisees, the milk of human kindness had curdled. They had religion, but they didn't have reality. They didn't have life. Now, Jesus not only preached in glittering generalities, but Jesus preached in often awesome specificity. For example, not only did Jesus say, go the second mile, but he gave illustrations of how they could go the second mile that went far beyond just carrying a soldier's backpack. For example, you go the second mile when your dignity is degraded. Look, if you will, in verse 38. Look at it. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. That is, go the second mile. The first mile is revenge. The second mile is to give place to evil. Now, now let me say this right away. Jesus is not talking pacifism. Jesus was not a pacifist. Jesus did not uh, say that we ought never to defend ourselves. That's not what he's talking about here. If you, if, <laughs> if you think that's what he's talking about here, you, you're going to be in, in, in awful trouble in this wicked world in which we live. What Jesus here is talking about is when you're insulted, uh, when, when uh, somebody has come and has degraded your dignity. Notice what he says. Stand up here a minute, Scotty. Uh, I won't hit your heart. Come here. Notice what he says, if somebody uh, strike you on your right cheek. Now, notice what he said, your right cheek. Point your right cheek. You know which one that is? Okay. Yes, All right, now, if, and, and the normal person is right-handed. Well, if I'm going to strike him, where would I normally strike him? I'd strike him on his left cheek. That's just normal. To strike him on his, on his right cheek is to give him what? You may see that. I'm not going to hit you. <laughs> to strike him on his, on his right cheek is to give him back of my hand. It's an insult. It's, it's like uh, in, in olden days when somebody would want to duel, they would take their gloves and slap a person. It's saying, you good for nothing, you low down person. And what our Lord is teaching here is that when somebody insults us, somebody degrades us, we'd go the second mile. Well, that's exactly what Paul taught in Romans chapter 12. Verses 17 and following, he says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. Overcome evil with evil. Good. And so, all of us are going to get insulted. All of us are going to be degraded. All of us are going to be looked down upon sometime. If you want to know really what you're full of, just see what spills out when you get jostled. I had not been a, a, a pastor of this church very long uh, when a man wrote me a letter. Evidently, he decided he didn't like the new pastor. And he wrote me a letter. It was a degrading letter. And very frankly, it was an unfair letter. Now, if he wanted some good things to criticize me about, I could have given him a list, but he, he didn't get any of the right things. He just got something that was really unfair. And he wrote me a letter, and it was an accusatory letter, a very unfair letter, and a very hurtful letter. I decided I'd take that man as a project. I wrote him back. Not, not a hypocritical letter, but I wrote him back a very kind letter. And when I saw him the next time, I went straight for him and said, how are you doing? Good to see you. And I really meant it from my heart. The next time I saw him, I went toward him. And again, and again, and again, and again. Finally, the man began to warm up to me and talk with me. And finally, I was able to do some things for him. Finally, he got down where he could not get around except in a wheelchair. And when he would come in the auditorium, I'd see him, I'd leave the platform and go and 
put my arms around him and hug him and tell him I loved him. Before he went to heaven, he told somebody, and that somebody told me, he said, you know that man Rogers is the greatest man in the world. Well, I'm not. I'm not. But I don't mind him thinking that. I don't mind him thinking that. But you know, I, I thought to that man, how I could have, when I could have just returned evil for evil and said he had it coming to him. Now, I wish I could tell you many success stories. Maybe that's the only one I have. <laughs> but I, I, I want to tell you, friend, that, that God honors the second mile. You want me to tell you how to get rid of an enemy? Make a friend out of him. Make a friend out of him. Jesus is saying, go the second mile, go the second mile when your dignity is degraded. Ah, oh, a two. Go the second mile when your adversary is victorious. Look, if you will, in verse 40 of this same chapter now. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, give him your cloak also. Now, the cloak here is, is like the overcoat. He says, if he gets, if he gets uh, in a lawsuit, he's victorious over you, uh, then just not, don't give him just simply what the settlement is. Give him more than the settlement. Now, our Lord here is not talking about somebody robbing you. He's not talking about if a robber comes in your house and say, let me guide you over here to the safe. He's not talking about that. He's talking here about a legal settlement. In this legal matter, there has been a brother who is adjudicated guilty. And so he has to give his coat. Jesus said, well, if you've been wrong and you know that you're wrong, don't just simply try to rectify that wrong by whatever the law says you must do. Do more than the law says you must do. Go the second mile. That's what Zacchaeus did, wasn't it? When Zacchaeus, he said, if I have wronged any man by false accusation, I, I restore unto him fourfold. Go the second mile. If you're wrong, when you apologize, get right with God. Get right with your brother. And then go the second mile uh, when, uh, when your brother's victorious over you. Number three, go the second mile when you have a brother, a sister in need. Look in verse 42. Give to him that asketh of thee, and to him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. We have to understand that uh, we, when, when we are like the pagans or when we are like the scribes and the Pharisees, we do all that is required and we do not one scintilla one iota more. But our Lord says do more. Do more. Give. Have a giving spirit. Because nothing that you own is really yours anyway. It's all placed on the altar. It belongs to God. Now, the implication here is that somebody has a genuine need. You have to learn how to give wisely. Psalm 112 verse 5 says, A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. <laughs> you, don't, you don't, if a drunkard asks you for money for uh, more alcohol, you don't give it to him. If a addict asks you for money for more dope, you don't give it to him. If a professional beggar is asking, you, you don't help that professional beggar by giving him uh, uh, something that's going to increase him in begging. Just because somebody asks, that doesn't mean that you necessarily are to give. You're to give with discretion. But what our Lord is saying is that you give, you give to those that have need. Don't just simply pay your bills. Go the second mile. Go the second mile, he's saying, when you're misused and abused. Look in verse 43. Uh, I can imagine they're listening to every word that Jesus is saying here. You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You know what you do when you get even? The sad thing is that's exactly what you do. You're up here. Somebody else is down here. They wrong you. You get even. <laughs> I mean, you just come right down to where they are. Why do you let them lower you to their standard? No, our Lord says this, that you, you go the second mile. Has somebody done you wrong? If they haven't, just wait, they will. And when you get revenge, you don't feel better. You might feel smug, 
The old flesh might be uh, lavishing a little bit, but in your spirit you hurt. But when you go the second mile, the second mile is the smile mile. There was a man reading the newspaper. He loved expensive automobiles, couldn't afford one, but he loved just to read the one ads. And he saw that a, a woman had uh, advertised in the newspaper a Jaguar automobile. It, low mileage, mint condition for $200. Oh, he said, this can't be true. But he just, he called the number and, and, and he said, the lady answered and said, are you the one who put the ad in the paper for a Jaguar, late model Jaguar, for uh, $200? What's wrong with it? She said, nothing's wrong with it. She said, I'm going to sell it to the first person who gets here. He said, I'll be right over. He said, I want to see it. He thought it was worth a chance. He drove over. There it sat in the driveway, absolutely beautiful. He looked it over. He couldn't see anything wrong with it. He said, lady, are you really going to sell this automobile for $200? She said, I was, but I've changed my mind. Now it's $99.50. I'm going to cut the price in half. He said, what's wrong with it? She said, not a thing in the world's wrong with it. Said, it's my husband's automobile. He ran off with his secretary to Hawaii. He told me to sell it and send him the money, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I, I suppose she felt good for just a little while. <laughs> but friend, it is, it is forgiveness, it is restitution, it is love that is, uh, that is the second mile. I read years and years ago, maybe 30, 40 years ago, I can't remember what a story that's always been in my heart about a soldier boy who at home would get on his knees and pray by his bed before he went to sleep. And he thought, would I, do I have the courage to do this in the barracks? Now, you can imagine what it'd be like for a soldier in the modern barracks to get down on his knees and pray beside his bed. He wrestled with his conscience. He said, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and he, hell, all these other guys in, in the obscene language and the dirty pictures and all that, this boy got down on his knees by his bed, by his bunk, and prayed and thanked God. Some got quiet and some admired him. There was a big old rough soldier that saw him and picked up his army boots and threw them at this boy while he was praying, struck him. The boy finished his prayers, went to sleep. The next morning when that man who threw the boots woke up, he found those boots beautifully polished, sitting by his own bed. That boy had polished his boots. I don't know a better example of that than going the second mile. The second mile. You see, I'm sure that when he polished those boots and gave them back and he returned good for evil, there was something that came over him, the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can get no other way. It's love. You see, the first mile is the master, uh, the, the first mile is the slave mile, the second mile is the mastery mile. The, the first mile is the legal mile. The second mile is the love mile. And so, the second mile, the smile mile, it's the mastery mile, it's the charity mile. I want to say one third thing about it. It is the victory mile. It is the victory mile. You see, the first mile when this boy is carrying this pack, he's a slave. But when he carries the second mile, he is a victor. I've been around people long enough and been leading people long enough and working with volunteers long enough and staff long enough and business people long enough. I have observed people who are successful people. Let me tell you one thing all successful people have in mind. Let me tell you something uh, that they have in common. Let me tell you something that all successful people do, all of them. They're second milers. Successful people are second milers on the job. You want to be a success? Be a second miler. If you do only what you're paid to do on your job, if you are a clock watcher, 
rather than a second miler, you're not going to go very far on your job. Uh, Henry Ford uh, took over the, the Lincoln factory uh, in, in uh, Illinois, and he, uh, it, it wasn't working. It was, it was uh, in Detroit, rather. Not in Illinois, but in Detroit. It was, it was losing money. Nobody seemed to really care. Henry, Henry Ford uh, got his maintenance crew, and he had them go out in the, uh, the woods and cut down a tree. And they trimmed the limb off of, limbs off of it and just left the stump, the log. And he had them put that log on the elevator and bring it up to the office floor. And then he had them lay that log right in front of the elevators. He didn't tell anybody about uh, why he had done it. Nobody knew when it was done. It was done in the nighttime. The next morning when people got there and they opened the elevator, there was a log lying right across in order to, they had to step over it. They had to walk around it. Why was it there? Who put a log in this place? Why doesn't somebody move it? Where is maintenance? But for three weeks, that log stayed there. Nobody did anything. Uh, management didn't say, why is the log here? Somebody didn't ask who put the log there. Nobody moved the log. Nobody inquired about the log. After a while, Henry Ford came up and he fired everybody on that floor. Everybody. Fired them all. Told them, said, I put the log here. I wanted to see if somebody, just somebody, wondered what is a log doing in front of the elevator? At least inquire about it, find out about it. But every one of you are just so interested in doing your job, nothing more, nothing less. I don't want you. Maybe the government wouldn't let him fire them all today for a log, but he did then. <laughs> Put his son Edsel in charge of that plant and began to make money. I'm telling you, folks, everybody in life who is victorious is a second miler. Be a second miler in school. You kids, if you're studying just to pass the test, if you're studying just to get a C, just to get the diploma, just to get out of school, you're never going to amount to much. You're going to school to learn, have a, have a, a hunger for knowledge. Read the lesson, more than the lesson. Find out all that you can find out. Don't just study enough to get by. When you find yourself knowing the material and mastering the material, you'll go to class with a smile on your face. I'll guarantee it. In marriage, my bride is sitting down there. Her father told us when we got married, he said, Adrian, I hear people say that marriage is a 50-50 proposition. He said, Adrian, it is not a 50-50 proposition. 50-50 is the first mile. He said, Adrian, a lot of times it's a 90-10. Sometimes you have to go 90% when the other person's only going to go 10%. And uh, Joyce and I found that's true, that in marriage, if you simply do what is required, what is right, what is fair, your marriage is not going to amount to much. There, there has to be a lot of going the second mile to make a marriage a right marriage. And those of you who have happy marriages, you know this. In your devotional life, you have to go the second mile. There's so many people say, I have a quiet time. I'm going to read a chapter a day. I'm going to ha have so many minutes in prayer. And it's a legal thing rather than a love thing. A dose a day keeps the devil away. And, and rather than loving and praying and seeking God with your whole heart, you just are one miler in your witnessing life. Do you know what will help you to be a good witness for the Lord Jesus more than anything else? Is to go the second mile. I want you to imagine this. Here's a boy. He's working out there. He's chopping in the fields. A Roman soldier comes by. Say, hey, you! Carry this load. Boy, he's so angry, he slams that hoe down. He's all right. Give it here. Let's go. He walks a mile, gritting his teeth, mumbling, thinking about that Roman soldier. He gets to that mile post. He slams it on the ground. He says, all right, I've done it. You're on top right now. You're on top. You're in control. 
one of these days, I hope we're in control. And Mr. Soldier, when we're in control, when we're on top, you're going to learn what it's like. We're going to get you. I just hope that day comes. He's angry. The soldier's angry. He goes home, bangs his fist against the barn door, goes in the house, slams the door, sits down, can't eat his dinner. He's angry, seething. I want you to notice a second miler. <laughs> that soldier says, hey, come here. Carry this load. Yes, sir. Be right there. Picks up the load and says, let's go. So where are you from? What part of Rome? I've never been to Rome. What's Rome like? And he begins to talk to us. Do you have a family? Are you married? Do you have children? They're carrying, walking along. After a while, he gets to the end. And the soldier says, well, I've enjoyed the conversation. He says, no, wait a minute. About another mile down there, there's a, there's a well. I know where we can get a cold drink of water. Let me carry this for you the second mile. And they go walking down there the second mile. And finally, he sets the backpack down. And that soldier looks at him. He said, I want to tell you something. You're different from any Jewish boy I ever knew. I hated the Jews and they hated us. I, there, there's something different about you. Well, the Jewish boy says, I hope there's something different about me. See, I heard Jesus preach one day. And he told me something about going a second mile. That's what I've been doing. Jesus, who is he? Oh, he's the Messiah of Israel. He's the one who came to redeem us, to give us new life. I want to ask you a question. Do you think that that second Jewish boy would have a better chance of witnessing than the first Jewish boy? <laughs> Do you think that he would have a better chance of sharing Jesus? Of course he would. Because, precious friend, not only are we witnesses, we're also part of the evidence. It's the second mile. It is the second mile that is the mastery mile. It is the second mile that is the charity mile. It is the second mile that is the victory mile and brings victory. And we will never really, as Christians, have the victory that we ought to have until we learn the smile mile that Jesus is talking about going the second mile. My. Let me just wrap it up and tell you this. That Jesus went the second mile for every one of us. Jesus did not practice what he preached. He preached what he practiced. You see, the first mile was God created us and gave us a chance and we failed it. God would have been perfectly just to cast us into hell. But Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the second mile. Jesus went the second mile. In a church service, a pastor was giving an invitation like I'm going to do in just a moment. A little child was in the service, had not been in the service before. And the little child saw people coming down all of the aisles. And the little guy asked his mother, said, where are they going? And the mother said, they're going forward to give their hearts to Jesus. And the little boy said, why don't we all go? That's a good question. <laughs> it is a good question. Because he's done so much for us. If I had a thousand lives, I'd want to give every one of them to Jesus. And friend, why don't we all give our lives to the one who loved us and gave himself for us? Would you bow your heads in prayer? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's stirring. If you want to be saved, let me lead you in a little prayer. And in this prayer, you can receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Right where you are. Just forget anybody else is here now. Just you, Jesus, and me. Would you pray a prayer like this? Lord, I know that you love me. And I know that you want to save me. I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And I want to be saved. Jesus, you died to save me. You promised to save me if I would only trust you. 
I do trust you, Jesus. Right now, this moment, right now, I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sin, cleanse me, and make me what you want me to be. And then pray this, Lord Jesus, because you've saved me, I will live for you, and I'll not be ashamed of you. Give me the courage always to stand up for you. In your name I pray, amen. We pray God has blessed you as you've watched this message. If you'd like additional copies or information on other resources, write us at Love Worth Finding, P.O. Box 38800, Memphis, Tennessee, 38183. You can also visit our online bookstore at lwf.org. In the U.S., you can place Visa or MasterCard orders by calling 1-800-274-5683, Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.